Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Aquinas Center of Theology. Um, we are kind of waiting for us to go live on Facebook as well. So, but I am not ever comfortable waiting as long as it takes to get on there. So we're getting get started. Um, I'm Sister Mary Priniski. I'm the Executive Director of the Aquinas Center of Theology at Emory University. And this is our fourth annual uh, Consistent Ethic of Life lecture. We're extremely excited to be co-sponsoring this with a number of, of uh, Emory um, organizations. But before we begin, um, we're thinking about today the consistent ethic of life. And so what I'd like to do is just to begin by recognizing the loss of life of eight people in the Atlanta area in the last few days who were killed. Um, they were, six of them were Asian Americans and um, mostly were women. So I'd like just to take a moment of quiet so that we can remember those people and remember they are also part of what we think of when we think of a consistent ethic of life. And since we've now been joined on Facebook, we welcome all of those who are joining us from Facebook. And uh, just to let you know, we're taking a moment of silence to pray for the victims of the shooting in the Atlanta area. So just a couple minutes of quiet. Good and gracious God, author of all life, tonight as we reflect on the gift of life that has been given to so many of us, we also remember those for whom their lives have been taken violently. Particularly here in Atlanta, the eight people who were killed in the last couple of days on a shooting spree. Only the latest in the number of deaths that have been killed in great numbers, whether it be because of racism, which is a questionable thing for this particular killing, but we know it is for so many. We ask that you receive all of those people in your loving arms, that you may challenge us to stand with those who are suffering and those who are on the margins and those who lives, whose lives are so fragile. We ask your blessings on this evening. We remember particularly those who have died, those we love who have died, those who have died from COVID. Be with us this evening and throughout our lives. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So welcome again, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce a few people who are co-sponsoring this event and ask them just briefly to tell you about their organizations and an opportunity for you to continue this conversation after this evening. First of all, the Aquinas Center, which is the um, main sponsor of this event. Uh, we are a Catholic center in the midst of Candler School of Theology, which is a Methodist School of Theology. And we have the opportunity to bring to the Atlanta area theologians from across the United States and the world to offer to the Catholic community in this area and beyond their wisdom around issues, questions in theology. Our theory of theology is that it's always about seeking the more about God. And mm -hmm. so we're constantly questioning, constantly learning, constantly lear um, expanding our understanding of an infinite God who can never be known. And so we invite you um, throughout the next year to join us in our various webinars and hopefully next year in-person events that we can explore together that vast mystery of who God is. Um, now I want to in invite uh, Josh Preston and Mariana Rodriguez Duran to talk about another sponsor of this event, the Medical Students for Life at the Emory campus. Thank you, Sister Mary. Um, like she said, my name is Josh Preston. I'm a second year medical student right now uh, and also will eventually be working on my PhD here in a few years. Um, 
So uh, Mariana and I began this group actually just this fall. Uh, we are an educational advocacy group and our main mission is essentially to protect the dignity and the rights of human lives from conception until natural death. Um, and we have obviously a particular focus on uh, medically related life issues. So anything from abortion to euthanasia, physician assisted suicide. Um, and we like to target our focus uh, on kind of promoting more holistic discussion on life issues within medicine uh, as it's often the under discussed thing. Uh, and we like to do community advocacy in this area to, to help mothers who are unexpectedly pregnant. And uh, lastly, you know, while we're formally uh, affiliated with the medical school, we encourage participation across campus. To my knowledge, I believe we're the only official pro-life uh, group on campus, uh, and we have members in the medical school, the law school, nursing school, graduate school, and undergraduate. Uh, if you'd like to get involved or know more about us, just please get in touch with uh, Mariana or me. And uh, we will also be hosting a follow-up discussion next Monday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, and you can get in touch with us for more details on that, but that'll be hosted by uh, Lindsay, who is a MDiv student who will be uh, moderating that. And she is on the call right now. And it'll just be basically a debrief for this and more of a chance to converse. And my name is Mariana. I'm also a second year medical student, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about our group. So first, we are a non-judgmental space, and we offer resources for people who have had an abortion and those who are experiencing an unplanned pregnancy. Um, these resources include um, things like resources that you may need to carry out your pregnancy or healing that you may need um, from a previous abortion. We are also a secular organization in the meaning that we welcome anyone from any faith and we um, respect any beliefs, so though you do not have to be of any particular faith to be part of our group. We're also bipartisan, so again, you don't need to subscribe to any party to be part of our group. And like Josh said, though we do cover many pro-life issues that are medically related, um, this extends, the pro-life mission extends beyond um, just abortion and physician-assisted suicide and other medical topics. So that is why we are co-sponsoring this event and we're excited to hear from Dr. Remmer Berry. Thank you, Mariana and Josh. And um, just so other people on the call know that once they've given their presentation, they're going down as attendees and they will be disappearing from your screen. So, um, Next, I want to introduce Michael Josh, who is the who works as in campus ministry at the Catholic Center, uh, to talk about the Catholic Center and their um, opportunity for conversation next week. Michael, hello everyone. My name is Michael Zaki. You're on mute, Michael. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Zaki, and I serve as the campus minister for the University Catholic Center at Emory University. I work with a Dominican priest named Father John Bowl, who's also on the call as an attendee tonight. Um, just a little bit about the University Catholic Center. We essentially serve as the parish for the university. So we provide sacramental opportunities, liturgical opportunities for students um, on campus usually, but during COVID, our opportunities are all online or in person in the front yard of the Catholic Center. Um, you can find out all of the information about the programming and activities that take place through the University Catholic Center at our website, which is emorycatholic.org. Um, and so feel free to peruse that at your leisure. But in regards to our follow-up conversation, we'll be discussing thoughts, reactions to this conversation, but specifically within the area of our faith. Um, so we would love to have you join us. Our discussion will be taking place on Wednesday of next week at 8 p.m. And the information for how to join our discussion will also be on our website, emorycatholic.org. Thank you, Michael. Um, the, other, the, the other organization that's co-sponsoring this event is Commonweal Magazine. And so we are appreciating their um, ability to uh, send this information on to their readership and we appreciate their co-sponsorship as well. Um, 
but now the main event of tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Emily Reimer Berry. Uh, Dr. Reimer Berry is a Catholic moral theologian. She's been a member of the Theology and Religious Studies faculty at University of San Diego since 2008. I have to do an aside though, she's from Alabama, which is our neighboring state. So when I heard she was from Alabama, I thought, isn't this wonderful? We have our neighbor coming back to us and being able to share with us her knowledge and experience over the last number of years. Um, Dr. Reimer Berry teaches undergraduate courses in Catholic theology, Christian ethics, sexual ethics, and ethical responses to HIV AIDS. Um, her research interests include women's experience of HIV AIDS, cross-cultural analysis of gender roles and marriage traditions, ethnography and ethical methodology, and the intersection of public health and Catholic social teaching. Um, uh, Dr. Reimer Berry got her BA at Notre Dame. She got her master's at Weston Jesuit School of Theology, which is now Boston College. And she got her PhD from Loyola University in Chicago. So she is coast to coast um, educated. So um, I wanted to introduce, uh, the, the other thing I find fascinating about her background is some of uh, many of the courses that she teaches uh, are community-based learning. And so she takes day trips, immersion experiences to, to Tijuana, Mexico. So she has a broad experience of working both with students and with the broader community. Um, I first heard of Dr. Reimer Berry when she gave a presentation at the Catholic Theological Society of America, and I understand from those who attended, got a standing ovation talking about expanding our understanding of pro-life. So we're excited to present on behalf of the Aquinas Center of Theology, Emily Reimer Berry. Emily. Wow, thank you so much for that very generous introduction, Sister Mary, and for the opportunity to be with you all um, on this webinar. I also want to thank all of the co-sponsors, um, so not just the Aquinas Center, but the Catholic Center, the Medical Students for Life, and Commonweal Magazine. I was first asked to share, as Sister Mary said, after I presented this at the Catholic Theological Society of America, and I have updated my presentation. And also, um, those who are familiar with what I said um, in 2019 will see that my thinking has evolved somewhat on these issues in the last two years. So let's get started. Beyond pro-life, pro-choice, Catholic perspectives on life issues. What does it mean to be pro-life? What does it mean to be pro-choice? Are these identifiers meaningful for the ethical work that we must do to build a more just society? My goal tonight is to invite us to think about words and their meanings, to be open to revising the language that we use so that we can foster more productive debates and more productive alliances, and ultimately to chart a new way forward that seeks common ground, realistic political strategies, and helps us to rethink our ethical priorities in the public square. I'm gonna start by talking about how we use pro-life and pro-choice in everyday speech. And then I'm gonna problematize those categories and invite us to move beyond the binary. Then I'll introduce what Catholic teachings call the consistent ethic of life, with particular attention to the papacy of Pope Francis whose framing of life issues moves beyond the binary. Returning to the question of abortion and abortion policy, I will propose that there is not one Catholic approach to this complex question. And I'll say more about that in my conclusion. So part one, our words are inadequate, moving beyond the binary. When Christians refer to the pro-life movement, they're usually talking about the goal of ending legal abortion through legislative means. This movement gained strength and became more ecumenical after the 1973 landmark Supreme Court decision Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion again in the US. Sometimes one also hears language regarding the unborn child's right to life. Pro-lifers often describe revulsion at the killing of innocent unborn life. Pro-life in everyday speech tends to mean a recognition of the inherent value of both maternal and fetal life and a goal of not seeing these lives in conflict. 
in the media, it's a common practice not to use the term pro-life, but rather to translate this activism into the descriptor anti-abortion. This translation is frustrating for many pro-life activists who see their work as constructive and life-affirming. The pro-life movement is a diverse group of activists, many of whom identify religious motivations for their work. They engage in sidewalk counseling at abortion clinics in order to educate patients and try to turn away women seeking abortions. They run pregnancy crisis centers and offer free or sliding scale prenatal services. This can include pregnancy tests, ultrasounds, nutrition assistance, supplies, and other kinds of help. They organize protests at clinics and marches to show public support for their work. A well-known one is the March for Life in January. They engage in voter education and mobilization efforts in order to elect pro-life politicians, as well as political lobbying and lawsuits to further their political agenda of reducing access to legal abortion at the, le at the local, state, and federal levels. Those who identify as pro-life think that the world would be more just if access to legal abortion were curtailed. When people identify as pro-choice, they usually mean that they are not opposed to the legal right of women to procure medical abortion. They see abortions as a legitimate component of a comprehensive reproductive health service plan for women. One often sees the claim that abortions should be safe, legal, and accessible, meaning that they should be available not only to wealthy or privileged women, but also to women who are poor, including those on public aid programs. Pro-choice Christians usually do not identify abortion as a moral good. They say that coerced pregnancy and motherhood do not align with women's inherent dignity and equality to men. They say that thinking about women only as baby carriers is reductionistic. So pro-choice advocates would say that fetal life is a value, but not the only value. The pro-choice movement is a grassroots movement in the same way that the pro-life movement is, and is built from a broad coalition. The heart of the pro-choice movement is maintaining women's access to abortion services. This means operating clinics, coordinating volunteers who serve as escorts to patients seeking care, given that crossing protest lines can make it difficult to uh, seek care, mobilizing support for ballot initiatives, lobbying efforts, legal cases, voting, and fundraising. Both movements engage in similar kinds of actions, but on different sides of the issue. But before we move on, I want to complicate the picture a bit. Doing so is important for a few reasons. Labels often oversimplify. Second, because I believe that there's actually a lot of unexplored common ground in the in-between space, and that the identifiers pro-life and pro-choice often create principled objections to solutions that could do a lot of work for a lot of people the labels themselves have become part of the problem, both because they oversimplify and because they enable people on both sides to create a sense of self-righteousness as we build up walls instead of building bridges. Let me put my cards on the table. I have become increasingly uncomfortable identifying as pro-life. Here we have the 45 the 45th president of the United States, who when he spoke at the 2020 March for Life said, and I quote, all of us here understand an eternal truth. Every child is a precious and sacred gift from God. Together we must protect, cherish, and defend the dignity and sanctity of every human life, end quote. Beautiful words. The scandal of this photo op is that his other actions, before and after taking office, demonstrated for me that he was not a good spokesperson for a movement that upholds human dignity. Part of why I became uncomfortable with the identifier pro-life is because members of that movement think that Trump is pro-life. 
But this meant that first, pro-life had been framed very narrowly. And second, that leaders of the pro-life movement had become increasingly comfortable aligning with the Republican party. I want to point out areas of common ground with those individuals while also drawing a line in the sand and admitting that I will not go so far as to claim President Trump as a pro-life leader. Um, indeed, I think he was the opposite. So I'll argue tonight that we need to move beyond this binary of pro-life and pro-choice in order to be more truthful and more effective as people of faith in the public square. I will not challenge magisterial teaching that there should always be a presumption against taking human life. Instead, I ask what that means for Catholic participation in political life and pragmatic discernment about how to foster a culture of life most effectively. And it's important for us to note that the role of a bishop in the public square is different than the role of a Catholic politician or even a Catholic voter. But I do hope that our conversation can move us forward as a church community to create more spaces for wrestling with moral complexity and ambiguity and accompanying people who are facing difficult discernments about responsible choices in their fertility. Many Americans already recognize this complexity and ambiguity when discussing abortion. Sarah Cliff's reporting from 2015 shows that many Americans are not comfortable picking a side. In the Perry Undum poll cited by Vox, 32% of respondents identified as pro-choice, 26% as pro-life, but a larger number refused to be categorized, and the remaining 42% either identified as both, neither, or refused to answer. I think this is because so many of us see that when a woman finds herself in need of an abortion, the abortion is not the only problem she faces. How can our moral vocabulary and political action better account for this growing awareness? The Guttmacher Institute reports that 18% of pregnancies, excluding miscarriages, in 2017 ended in abortion. It may be startling for us to realize, but at 2014 rates, one in four U.S. women will have an abortion by the age of 45. As Rachel Atkins has noted, there aren't women who have abortions and women who have babies. Those are the same women at different points in their lives. And we need to realize that our sisters, aunts, mothers, grandmothers, friends and neighbors beside us in the pews are indeed among this number. 24% of abortion patients in 2014 identified as Catholic. More Catholics have abortions than mainline Protestants or evangelical Protestants. Abortion has become a routine part of, of women's reproductive health care delivery in the U.S. context. I'm a Catholic feminist who wants to support real women in precarious situations and not at the cost of shaming women in the pews or of perpetuating a toxic partisan political climate. We need a movement to reduce abortions that is also pro-woman and pro-justice in the very thickest sense. As we enter the second year of COVID-19 lockdowns, we need to keep in mind the urgent life questions that continue to confront us. Coronavirus has exposed and worsened social inequalities throughout the globe. Not everyone has a home in which to shelter in place. Rising numbers of domestic violence help us understand that home is not always safe, especially for women and children. Pregnancy can be an especially dangerous time for a woman in an abusive relationship, as abuse often begins or escalates during pregnancy when an abusive and controlling partner resents how a pregnant woman's attention shifts to her growing belly and planning for her future. 
communities of color are disproportionately infected and affected by COVID-19 in the US. In an economic system in which healthcare is seen as a benefit for some employees instead of as a human right, many workers have lost access to healthcare benefits when they lost their jobs. We have also seen that not all workers can work from home. Lower wage workers deemed essential, such as grocery store clerks, hospital staff, meatpacking workers, sanitation crews, and others face more dangerous conditions than higher wage workers, many of whom can accomplish their work remotely. But for those essential workers who are also parents, what are they to do when schools and daycares are not open? To analyze our COVID-19 experience through a gendered lens is very important. With regard to the focus of our work tonight, we need to underscore why many working women are leaving the workforce completely right now. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were 2.2 million fewer women in the labor workforce in October 2020 than in October 2019. But women are not necessarily choosing to leave. As economist Catherine Edwards argues, women are being shoved out by disproportionate job loss, shuttered schools, lack of childcare, pay disparities, and lack of public policy to support working women. Working parents have been asked to do the impossible in the past year, and it is not sustainable. Elementary schools and childcare centers are still not open all across the country a year after they closed. In my community of San Diego, where I live now, public schools return to in-person instruction on April 12th. Attention to both the joys and the difficulties of parenting must become part of our moral vocabulary if we are to make any progress in moving beyond the binary, as I am recommending that we do. Catholic social teachings actually have a lot to say about the social responsibility we have for one another and how we need to work together to build a more just society. So that brings me to section two, Catholic teachings on life issues. Catholic teachings on life issues demand respect for the human person from conception to natural death. When we approach moral issues from the principle of the inherent dignity of every person, there are significant social implications. Joseph Cardinal Bernadine is credited with articulating the consistent ethic of life which he developed in his 1983 Gannon lecture at Fordham University, in which he said he was, quote, convinced that the pro-life position of the church must be developed in terms of a comprehensive and consistent ethic of life. He saw the same principle operating in Catholic teaching against nuclear war as in Catholic teaching against abortion namely the principle which prohibits the directly intended taking of innocent human life. It is this principle then, and the corresponding attitude of respect for human life that must be applied consistently across all moral issues. Bernadine then explains how this would demand a heroic social ethic that would translate to political and economic positions on tax policy, welfare policy, nutrition and feeding programs, and health care. Bernadine said, and I quote, those who defend the right to life of the weakest among us must be equally visible in support of the quality of life of the powerless among us, the old and the young, the hungry and the homeless, the undocumented immigrant and the unemployed worker, end quote. More recently, Jesuit author James Martin links his advocacy for refugees, the LGBT community, and the environment to his consistent ethic of life position. The consistent ethic of life is a major theme in the writings of Pope Francis, who calls our attention to a consistent ethic of life in Laudato Si, Amoris Laetitia, Che Rito Amazonia, and Fratelli Tutti. Laudato Si was promulgated in 2015 and expands our vision of what a consistent ethic of life means. Rejecting anthropocentrism 
Catholics are called to address the life questions that confront us in a world of overconsumption, globalization, militarism, and destruction of the natural world. A key claim within the encyclical is that the natural world discloses the sacred. Drawing on Franciscan theology, the Pope says that nature is a magnificent book in which God speaks to us and grants us a glimpse of his infinite beauty and goodness. The human person is decentered in the theological anthropology of this document. We are part of creation. We are not the center or the apex of creation. In this view, a consistent ethic of life means consideration for all life, the health of ecosystems, endangered species, flora and fauna. Responsible fertility must be discerned in light of this ecological crisis on our planet, which cannot sustain unlimited procreativity. Amoris Laetitia was promulgated in 2016 after the Synod on the Family and attends to many challenges of family life. Pope Francis does not simply restate ideals of church teaching, but proposes a way forward that accompanies families through the messiness of real life. This is captured well by his phrase, we do well to focus on concrete realities in 31. For Pope Francis, these include lack of dignified or affordable housing, economic constraints that prohibit a family's access to education, pornography, prostitution, sexual abuse of children, migration, human trafficking, extreme poverty, drug use, alcoholism, and more. Family life is messy. But his message is that as people of faith, we need to be there for one another and help one another, not just preach with an attitude of self-righteousness and judgment. He writes, and I quote, many people feel that the church's message on marriage and the family does not clearly reflect the preaching and attitudes of Jesus, who set forth a demanding ideal yet never failed to show compassion and closeness to the frailty of individuals like the Samaritan woman or the woman caught in adultery. He also writes in that document, and I quote, responsible parenthood does not mean unlimited procreation or lack of awareness of what is involved in rearing children, but rather the empowerment of couples to use their inviolable liberty wisely and responsibly, taking into account social and demographic realities, as well as their own situation and legitimate desires. Amoris Laetitia promotes a pastoral theology sensitive to the particular context in which people make decisions about their sexual choices and their family life. Kerita Amazonia was promulgated after the Amazonian Synod and brings together concern for indigenous communities and the environment. Pope Francis expresses shame for the colonial conquest of America and asks forgiveness for the terrible crimes that followed throughout the history of the Amazon region. He explains that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Fratelli Tutti was Pope Francis's love letter to Catholic voters before the 2020 election. Promulgated on October 3rd, 2020, the document is about social friendship and restates many key principles of Catholic social thought. Critical of politicians who are focused only on their own self-interest or ego, the Pope reminds readers that the end of politics is always the common good. In chapter two, he interprets the parable of the Good Samaritan, reminding us that we should not be indifferent bystanders. With regard to the consistent ethic of life, the Pope laments how too often in our world, persons are no longer seen as of paramount value to be cared for and respected, 
especially when they are poor and disabled, not yet useful like the unborn, or no longer needed like the elderly. He says, and I quote, we have grown indifferent to all kinds of wastefulness, starting with the waste of food, which is deplorable in the extreme. We have seen what happened with the elderly in certain places in our world as a result of the coronavirus. They did not have to die that way, end quote. They did not have to die that way. With regard to a consistent ethic of life, Pope Francis names racism as a sin, which shows us that our supposed social progress is not as real or definitive as we think. He restates that human trafficking is a contemporary form of enslavement. He rejects politics rooted in anti-migrant and ethnocentric biases and fears. He restates Catholic teachings on peacemaking and the death penalty, saying, and I quote, we can no longer think of war as a solution because its risks will probably always be greater than its supposed benefits. Every war leaves our world worse than it was before. And he writes, the death penalty is inadequate from a moral standpoint and no longer necessary from that of penal justice. Not even a murderer loses his personal dignity and God himself pledges to guarantee this. I will give everyone the possibility of sharing this planet with me despite all our differences. Thus, if Catholics are to enter political debates today about life issues, we need to recognize what issues count as life issues. For Pope Francis, as we've seen, life issues include poverty, racism, consumerism, war, the death penalty, health care, homelessness, substance abuse, sexual violence, care for the elderly, and so many more related issues. It is intellectually dishonest to boil all life issues down to abortion or to claim as the US bishops do that abortion is the preeminent priority. To do so misrepresents Catholic teachings on life issues. A consistent ethic of life framework provides a challenge to both Democratic and Republican platforms and legislative agendas. Neither political party maps neatly onto Catholic teachings. I'm gonna say that again. Neither political party maps neatly onto Catholic teachings. But when abortion is prioritized above all other life issues, this tips the scales toward Republican agendas and opens up the USCCB to the critique that they are in fact being partisan. Now I'm gonna to move to what I consider a better way forward. So part three, away from legislative action and renewed attention to structural supports for women and children. So I wanna circle back to abortion now and abortion policy. I wanna restate that my goal as a Catholic feminist is to reduce the number of abortions. But the question is how? Here I depart from the action plan promoted by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Many feminists have noted that it would demonstrate respect for women if the culture treated women as subjects capable of being persuaded to the good. As moral agents, capable of making decisions for themselves. If we, are work, if we are to work together to reduce the number of abortions, I suggest that we need to stop talking past one another and develop strategies that create safer communities, healthier sexual relationships, and stronger social supports for vulnerable women and children. I advocate here for a reproductive justice movement that begins by listening to and supporting women from all cross sections of society. Now, I did not create this language of reproductive justice on my own. I'm relying on the work of um, feminists from the 1970s, as well as um, uh, black feminist activists uh, who, like Loretta Ross, who I'm gonna be citing in a minute. 
um, who've done a lot of theoretical work on reproductive justice. So reproductive justice feminist Marilyn Katz, founder of the Reproductive Rights National Network, stated that the real impetus for the network was to reframe the debate, to talk about the conditions which would be necessary for women to be able to make a real choice about whether or not to have children. R2N2 did not narrow their political agenda to abortion rights. Rather, they perceived their cause much more broadly to include access to affordable childcare, healthcare, a living wage, birth control, and disability pay during pregnancy for working women. For this movement, any political strategy that did not attend to these structural needs, it was inadequate. Scholar activist Loretta J. Ross explains further, and I quote, in abortion debate, debates of privacy, women's rights, fetuses, and the law, the isolation of abortion from other social justice issues like violence against women fails to incorporate the intersecting issues that actually determine how a pregnant woman makes the decision to have a baby. She may base her decision on available health care, housing, violence, age, finances, her partner, education, immigration status, or other considerations. Combinations of social and economic issues matter." End quote. We need to think about what it would mean to win the abortion debate. I suggest that Catholics will not win the abortion debate in the Supreme Court, Senate, House of Representatives, or even state legislatures. We need to recalibrate what it would mean to win. Following Kathy Rudy, I believe that a tradition only wins in the abortion debate when a woman with an unwanted pregnancy sees the hope and possibilities offered to her by that tradition and changes her interpretation of her pregnancy as a result. Every year around the Feast of the Epiphany, a meme circulates on Facebook that captures my vision of this new action plan for reproductive justice. So in contrast to the story of the Magi that we hear in Matthew's infancy narrative, this contemporary feminist midrash explains, three wise women would have asked directions, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, brought practical gifts, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and there would be peace on earth. The wisdom embedded here is practical, everyday feminist wisdom. That's what women facing unplanned pregnancies need to hear from our church and from a new social movement today. To that end, this final section of my talk is going to summarize what I think a Catholic action plan for reproductive justice would prioritize. Listening to women, changing our political strategy, providing robust structural supports for women and children, and attending to a wider range of life issues. So I think our plan should begin by centering women in our abortion discourse. We need to understand more how women's stories need to be central. And that includes stories of miscarriage, pregnancy loss, you know, understood more broadly than just abortion. Um, and it also includes stories of sexual violence. We also need new liturgies for Catholic women healing from miscarriage, sexual violence, and abortion. We need a new communication strategy with messaging that empowers people in difficult discernments, removing shaming discourse and embedding a consistent ethic of life. As an employer, the church should lead the way by revising employment contracts so that pregnant employees feel supported and encouraged to choose life for their unborn children. I think we need to change our political strategy. We should stop efforts to criminalize abortion. The focus of this movement should not be overturning Roe v. Wade, crafting more restrictive legislation at the state level, or seeking to defund Planned Parenthood. While the research is speculative, 
a number of studies have argued that overturning Roe is not the most effective strategy in reducing the abortion rate. If we follow this action plan, we limit the ways that politicians and their proxies can use abortion as an issue to divide Americans, fostering a toxic political climate. This would be a significant shift for the Catholic Church to adopt, but it would bear fruit in that it will create the possibilities for new alliances across party lines. I also advocate for partnerships with Planned Parenthood in areas where there is legitimate common ground, judgment-free response to survivors of sexual assaults, comprehensive sexual education, STD testing, stigma reduction and suicide prevention for the LGBT community, cancer screenings, and wellness counseling. Recognizing different missions and organizational values, there will not be strategic alliance in all areas, but a new social movement for reproductive justice will stop demonizing Planned Parenthood which is one of the largest providers of healthcare for women in the US. A Catholic action plan for reproductive justice would also prioritize structural supports for women and children. We should provide free or sliding scale infant daycare at every Catholic parish and place of work, including Catholic hospitals and universities. Building a culture of life extends far beyond the maternal delivery room of the hospital. Catholic parishes would be the ideal spaces for robust sliding scale infant daycare facilities nationwide, serving the needs of the local communities and inclusive of children of all creeds, races, and social classes. And of course, we must address poverty as a constraint to agency. Bumper stickers and marches don't go far enough in giving poor women greater agency. Women with unplanned pregnancies know well that parenting children means providing for their physical, educational, and emotional needs. A renewed movement must advocate for strengthened govern government support for, po for poor families. This includes revised tax policies, support for equal pay for equal work laws, non-discrimination laws, robust support of fair housing, and a solid welfare safety net, including food programs and universal health care. There is also a role for middle axioms of support here, from parish-based food pantries to Facebook groups for sharing used children's clothing and blankets and such. Finally, our plan should aim to nurture and protect all life. We need to join the Green Revolution, advocate against the death penalty, ensure all seniors have safe and affordable housing and medications, craft immigration policies that are rooted in the principles of human dignity and care for the vulnerable. And we cannot settle for the status quo of maternal and infant mortality rates that disproportionately impact communities of color. I started off tonight talking about the terms pro-life and pro-choice. I hope that now you can see why I think those labels misrepresent the complexities of life issues, one of which is abortion. You can still be a good Catholic while opting out of a stale political pro-life movement that focuses on legislative agendas. Another movement is possible, a movement that would reduce abortions while empowering women. But to get there, we will have to work together across party lines, across lines of race, class, and creed. We need this renewed social movement for reproductive justice. We need it. We need this movement firmly rooted in a consistent ethic of life and a framework of social justice. This movement will begin by listening to women's complex stories, accompanying them on their journeys, empowering them to make decisions that align with their deepest values, and reorganizing our social structures to resemble the care of those most in need. This new social movement will transform our parish infrastructure to serve the needs of the smallest among us. This new movement will build bridges of understanding between social service agencies and advocacy groups. I hope you will join me as we work together in a social movement for reproductive justice, no matter what labels you use to describe yourself. Thank you.
Thank you, Emily. I'd like to just take a minute of quiet to um, honor what we've heard, reflect on our own stance towards life. And then I have a lot of questions that have arisen. So let's just take a moment. I'm gonna take the prerogative of, as the host and, and ask a question that um, has come up in a conversation I had with somebody from Emory who does public health. Um, I mentioned to him in an email that I saw that um, you know women have moral, we have a moral stance and we can make moral choices as you were saying women we need to let women make moral choices. And I thought that, uh, that the, the um, uh, having to make a choice about abortion was a moral issue. And his response to me was he, in his world of public health, he saw abortion as an economic issue. And my response to him was, aren't economic issues moral? Don't we talk about budgets as, more, as moral issues, as moral documents? So could you just address a little bit about the moral issue, the economic issue of abortion? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I think that what Catholic social teaching invites us to think about is that the human person is social by nature and we flourish only in relationships. And what that communicates to me is that this project of flourishing together is a very complex project that is going to take a lot of, um, it's gonna take a lot of expertise from a lot of different disciplines and we're gonna to need to work together. And, but they're intersecting realities. And so public health, economics, you know, medical expertise, these all need to be able to work together. I think of, you know, when we talk about like the difference between medicine practiced at three feet, you know, like the patient doctor relationship and public health practiced at 30,000 feet, you know, the goal of public health is to think about the health of communities and to look at broad trends. And so one of the limitations of a public health mindset is that you start to think in statistics mm -hmm. and you lose the face of the patient who's right in front of you. And yet we really need those long-standing trends and analyses to be able to think about why a smoking cessation program is going to be good for us or why we need to think about heart disease and why it is that we're experiencing structural racism and OBGYN um, practices such that um, you know we see Black women, um, maternal mortality rates 2.5 times that of white women. Um, that there are really structural problems that we need to think about through multiple perspectives. And I, so on the one hand, yes, if even if we're talking about a woman with an unplanned pregnancy, that's a moral question. That's also an economic question for her. <laughs> She's got to pay the bills. She has to figure out how to provide for herself and her child. And often women are doing that alone, although not exclusively, but women facing unplanned pregnancies cannot always assume that they're gonna have a partner. And so I think that it's not just economics, but economics is a part of it. And of course, it's always a moral question. I think everything's a moral question. So that's a great question. I, I think I could go on and on about that, but you said you had a lot of questions, so I don't wanna say we too do. much more about that. <laughs> We have a lot of questions. So I'm gonna just, um, I wanna give thanks to Lindsay and Callie who are monitoring the questions and sending them on to, to me. So I'm taking uh, advantage of their expertise. Yeah. So here's the first question. Can you speak to what it feels like a schism within the Catholic church regarding life issues? It appears that many right-leaning Catholics have a narrow view of life. I have been accused of moral relativism as a left-leaning Catholic and asked why I still belong to the church. I understand the need to move beyond non-binary terms, but I am at a loss as to how to engage in this conversation. 
Thank you for that question. And uh, I think I'm still developing the moral vocabulary to navigate that because what I'm trying to do is to bring more people towards the middle for that common ground conversation, which I admit is difficult, um, even at, you know, in, in small group parish settings. There is a tendency um, among, uh, among people of faith, let's say, uh, in the pro-life movement to use, to sometimes use more rigid language and I think we see that modeled, unfortunately, by leaders in, uh, you know, clergy leaders, especially within Catholicism. And that hasn't proved helpful since um, the 1975, um, you know, pro-life action plan. So I think that one of the challenges that I'm trying to frame within my research is to say, well, Look, after Roe v. Wade in 1973, um, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops developed a political action plan where they really started this mobilization effort, this grassroots mobilization effort to focus on single issue politics. And abortion really became a single issue um, political strategy for uh, leaders in the Catholic Church in the US. And I think that has that has not served us well. It hasn't served us well in our political climate, but it also has not served us well in our faith communities because it has meant that um, we've become more polarized in our faith communities. And also in our political climate, we're contributing to the polarization within the US. And so I would like for us to move away from, you know, the framework that, that sees the single issue um, political strategy, uh, you know, as the best way forward. And I think that the consistent ethic of life doesn't map to either political party, but offers us such a rich foundation of the kinds of political action campaigns that we should be a part of. And so it doesn't mean that each of us needs to commit our entire life to focusing on every one of those issues. Of course, that would be impossible. There's only 24 hours in the day. But it does mean that we need to hear much more from the pulpit and, you know, in broader Catholic settings about anti-death penalty advocacy as a pro-life issue or as a consistent ethic of life issue, um, or, you know, about a broader range of issues in medical ethics than just abortion, um, you know, and to, to be able to really see that our political, our political work as Catholics is not just reduced to a single issue. Um, I, I, I also don't want us to say that we shouldn't get involved in politics or that, you know, there's no place for religion in the public square, because I, I would disagree with that. I, I think that we do need to shape the public square um, through, you know, it, it, through our values. Um, and yet it should not be through this single issue and, and kind of rigid way. Thank you. Um, next, how can we express sympathy for women in harsh circumstances? who seek abortions without implying support for abortion? That's a great question. And I think it depends on your role um, because that, um, you know, there are certain roles in which that uh, would be more difficult than others. I think what Pope Francis is inviting us to is a theology of accompaniment. And a theology of accompaniment means that we walk alongside someone and we listen to their struggle, we hear their story, and we offer support as they're engaging in their discernment. And that might mean that when asked for our advice, we offer our authentic advice. And yet it also means that it comes from a deep respect and mutual, you know, mutual friendship. Um, so that no matter what her decision is, we're still there for her to support her. Um, it also means in some cases referring to, uh, you know, referring to other avenues of support if you can't offer the support that she's asking for. So um, within Catholic teaching, uh, there are really helpful principles that can be invoked to, to help us navigate these really messy questions. So, you know, 
we don't always think of ourselves as like being a part of a, you know, an ideal where we can always choose the good in every situation. Sometimes things are messy. There's a great deal of complexity and ambiguity. So principles like the principle of toleration, um, principles like double effect and um, cooperation within our tradition, if you're not familiar with those, you know, then you could become more familiar with those and they can help you to sort through what it means to weigh values and disvalues within a particular situation. So for example, in the principle of cooperation, you know, it really matters how close you are to the situation in which you're um, cooperating with the person who's sinning, right? So there's a difference between remote and material cooperation and the way that the church talks about that principle. Um, and so, you know, I think that actually going to our tradition and to some of the complexities um, of our tradition can, can be actually really fruitful. Um, but most of all, it's to support, as the question posed, support the woman in her context and ensure that she has the resources that she needs and that she's treated as a human subject. Thank you. There's a, uh, we have a, a huge number of questions here. I want to just jump into this one because it kind of follows on what we were just talking about. Um, sadly, I think the main obstacle to listening more to women, which is what you were just talking about, and advocating for more dialogue is that more traditional ordained clergy, deacons, diocesan priests, and bishops have bought into the pro-life political argument. How do you propose we help change the hearts and minds of these more traditional ordained clergy? That's a great question. Um... When I talk about centering women's experiences um, in the talk, the reason I have that in there is that I've become increasingly more aware that liturgical spaces are shaped by masculine identity, masculine experience of the divine. Preaching in a Catholic space is through the lens of male experience. And there aren't all that many opportunities for clergy to learn about women's experiences of pregnancy, of pregnancy loss, and of domestic violence. And I think that if there were more opportunities for women to share their stories and share their experiences, I think that clergy would, it, would begin with a, with a space of empathy. I think that when you hear the trauma of some of these women's stories, and when you see that there are so many women who are just trying to do the best that they can, when you meet them where they are, then you begin to recognize um, some of the really difficult, to, you know, the really difficult stories and narratives. And so the best the, my best strategy, at least so far, is to say that we need more women at the table, we need more women teaching in seminaries, and we need more opportunities for men, especially men who are not married to women, um, to hear the stories, including some of the hard stories of what it means to bleed out after a miscarriage, of what it means to not know if you should go home because you think that you're gonna be beaten by your partner, um, of what it means to try to move out of an apartment in eight hours and not know where you're gonna sleep that night. And certainly there are a lot of people who know th because of their deep listening and the kinds of ministries that they're engaging in. But I do think that we need to think about not just abortion as an issue, but we need to think about it as it meets real people's lives. And as we do that through the virtue of empathy, I, I think that we'll begin to recognize how many structural changes we really do need. You know, one of the things as you've been talking that is certainly is striking me is that it's not just about abortion, but it's about trauma. It's about miscarriages. It's about um, uh, sexual abuse. Um, we think about the abortion issue and we think abortion. So I'd just like you to reflect a little bit more on like the, not the range of the issues, but what, what are women going through? 
in, in, in the whole range of sexual issues that ultimately get just lumped into this issue of don't have an abortion. Yeah, and the reason I was bringing up miscarriage, I guess I didn't state that very clearly, is because sometimes the medications that women need when they're experiencing pregnancy loss through spontaneous abortion um, are some of the same medications that are prescribed for a direct abortion. And so when we talk about sort of a holistic approach to women's health care and what it would mean in terms of the impact of criminalizing abortion and, you know, some of the legislative proposals that have moved forward, sometimes we, we neglect to think about the, the secondary impacts for suffering women that it might further create some trauma. But your question what does it mean to think more holistically about everything that women are going through? I mean, I think um, I see Pope Francis as an advocate for identifying patriarchal structures as sinful and helping us to think through um, the importance of abolishing structural patriarchy and abolishing colonialism, abolishing racism. Um, but this is, you know, it's one thing to say like smash the patriarchy. Pope Francis is saying to smash the patriarchy. It's another thing to think, boy, like how did I participate in clericalism through this particular action? Or how did I participate in racism by not speaking in this committee meeting or whatever? You know, I think that in large and small ways, we in our in our wider culture and in our church are beginning to recognize that racism, colonialism, sexism are part of the structural sins that we're kind of swimming in all the time and that are malforming our moral imagination. And so we there's a, a sense in which we need to lament and express remorse for personal sins you know, including our participation in racism, sexism, et cetera. But there's also a sense in which these are so broad that they're not attached to one person's agency. And yet we need to continue to work together to build um, a culture of life, you know, that, that is really gonna provide for the flourishing of everyone. And so I think blindness to women's suffering is one of the hallmarks of patriarchy. Um, and Pope Francis is really inviting us to kind of open the, open the window there. So someone um, asked about the, what the bishops mean that it, the abortion is the preeminent issue. How did they come to that? How do they define it? And how the term fits into the Catholic tradition? How, sorry, how the term preeminent priority? Preeminent how abortion is the pre preeminent issue. How did they come to that as the preeminent issue? How do they define it? Mm -hmm. And how does that fit into the Catholic tradition? Thank you for that question. So um, they, they're restating the claim that um, life is sacred from conception to natural death. And in talking about abortion as a preeminent priority, they're saying that, um, a, that a culture that does not honor life in the womb, that does not honor the sacredness of life in the womb is um, sort of broken from the beginning. Um, that's not their language, that's mine. I'm trying to sort of summarize. Um, it, it's a way for them to talk about the centrality of life as an issue, um, but boil it down to, to abortion because of the way that they want to, to frame, you know, all of us come, all of us experience life through being born. And so if we're going to talk about what it means to be pro-life, if we're going to talk about a culture of life, then for them, it makes sense kind of intellectually to then say, well, we need to be 
pro-life in the sense of affirming this anti-abortion uh, stance. We need to be sure that the child in the womb is given respect as a human person and that the child in the womb is even given legal protection is, is what the bishops are hoping for. So that's, that's, the, that's the trajectory. It, it's because of their hyper-focus on the sacredness of life from conception to natural death, but then you know, it, it's sort of more of a philosophical claim that life is beginning in the womb and needs to be respected from conception as a human person and then legal protection of the human person in the womb. Um, and, and, you know, legal protections are a part of their political strategy. So here's a, another total shift your brain now. <laughs> this question is, could you speak to how a college student might begin to get involved with how to help unite both sides to reduce abortions? I would like to approach my local church, but not sure if that's the best approach. I love that question and the enthusiasm of the question. Um, I mean, one of the um, one of the challenges is first to get to know your community and the needs of your of your community. And in some communities, that might mean um, a baby blanket drive. In some communities, that might mean, you know, raising awareness uh, through a book club. Um, there could be an opportunity to read about an issue from multiple perspectives and kind of bring people to the table. Um, but I, I appreciate that the goal there is both um, educational and formative, but then also action oriented. And so what I would encourage you to do is to begin by listening, you know, immersing yourself within that particular context and begin to understand what are the needs of that community. So that can include, you know, um, are there housing concerns? You know, if a woman faces an unplanned pregnancy within that community, um, as a college student, like, would, would college students within your community have to leave school? Would there be daycare available? Um, what are the policies at the school already for pregnant women? What are the policies um, to enable uh, women who have given birth and then come back um, to be able to access services um, and, and to be able to complete their graduation requirements? You know, are there, um, barriers to completion of graduation requirements that women are experiencing at higher degrees than men. Like those are the kinds of policy issues you could think about at the local level and work to, uh, and, you know, work on those. In some cases, pregnant women can't live in residential halls anymore. And so they would have to leave a residential hall. Um, or is there another apartment style setting um, that is open and available and affordable? You know, so those are the kinds of kind of on the ground questions that could be asked, you know, as one is trying to think about not just what, what are my values, but how can I ensure that I'm caring for someone who's in a difficult situation right now? And what, what can I do to make things easier for someone in the future? Thank you. Um, I, if you remember, I sent you on a question that came on earlier, and I want to repeat it now. And, uh, are not the efforts of the Catholic Church and other religions to deny women the legal right to choose an abnegation of their religious freedom. This seems to be a matter of conscience made important in the documents of Vatican II and further gives a right to the unborn fetus that trumps the mother's rights. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, there is a document of Vatican II called Dignitatis Humanae um, that affirms the dignity and agency of the human subject. And so I think that that question is really inviting us to think about how women are seen as moral agents and moral subjects when making these really difficult choices. Um, of course, what the authoritative teachings of the church would say is that there are two lives at stake and that we should seek a solution in which both of those lives can flourish. So my approach would be 
broadly speaking, to think about the kinds of structural supports that would enable that woman facing a difficult choice to be able to say yes and give um, life to that contingent life, uh, fetal life, to bring the baby to term. And to do that in a way that's not dehumanizing, to do that in a way that does not then um, reduce her own dignity, choices, um, her own hope for a future um, that doesn't in any way um, constrict her sense of her belovedness. And I think that's, that's, that's the issue, that there's so many challenges um, that, that, that women face where they really feel like it's a choice between this or that. And, and they don't feel that, that they're able to choose in such a way that they can bring their baby's life to term and then also um, choose in such a way that is good for them. And so it's, I, I would like to see that we, I would like to see us phrase that as a false choice. Um, but so many women's stories reflect that those are real choices that women are making. Okay, somehow I muted myself. I'm not sure what that happened. Um, in practical terms, working towards structural change will require legislative action on some level. Why then is legislative action inappropriate for reducing abortion? Well, legislative action for tax policies, legislative action for um, the minimum wage, for fair housing, I think of those as different kinds of legislative action than legislative action that would make some medical procedures um, uh, illegal uh, for women. So I guess I'm thinking of those as different kinds of, um, of actions. And instead, you know, in the ways that we continue in medical ethics to affirm the patient's, the patient's consent to really identify the pregnant woman um, within this situation, really to see her as the agent and the one who um, needs to be able to make that decision of self-determination instead of the state making that on her behalf. Um, so that is an aspect of what it means to be an agent, what it means to have human dignity is to be able to make those medical decisions that are going to affect uh, one's, one's body and one's life. Um, I mean, I think it's worth naming in this space that pregnancy itself can be dangerous. Yesterday, 830 women around the world died, pregnancy-related childbirth complications. And that's gonna happen again today and again tomorrow and again the next day. So until maternal mortality is recognized as a scandal that we lament and that we are ashamed to even think about in the same way that we talk about abortion, then I don't think that we've really understood the, I don't think we've really walked in women's shoes. Um, and I think that as soon as we start to talk about other complicating factors like social determinants of health, then it just gets even more complicated. Um, so it's true that, that, there, uh, that I, what I'm talking about would require some legislative actions and social programs and social policies. But when we're talking about coercion, and the use of the law to coerce, then I become very reluctant to see the law used in any way that would affirm patriarchy and patriarchal power over women. And to follow that up, one of the things we're seeing in a number of states are le um, legislations that are called heartbeat bills. So the question is, what is your opinion on how a middle ground can be found between the medical community and reproductive justice in light of the heartbeat bills that have been altering timing of abortions? Um, so I still have a lot of research to do on this. I was just reading the Arkansas um, bill 
Senate Bill 6 that passed, uh, let's see, last week that a lot of folks think are gonna be um, a challenge to Roe. And it's, it's in some ways um, similar to what I was just saying. I, my preference would be that we not proceed by heartbeat bills or other kinds of legislative action because what this does is it takes the decision making away from the pregnant woman who's close to the situation and the care um, that her provider is helping her to assist with. And it removes it and takes it to a, a different level where we now have um, legislators or um, folks speaking on behalf of the state, um, thinking about the, the good of the state for the life of the child. Um, I do think that there's a helpful move to the extent that if, if this is a movement that is generated by authentic expressions of pro-life commitments, and by pro-life commitments, um, we mean support for women, then I think what we, what, what we should start to demand from the groups who are behind this is that they not just be pro-birth, but pro-life in the sense of the consistent ethic of life. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of framing or positioning that I, would, that I would like to see. I also think sometimes these bills have um, flawed terminology in that they're kind of loosey with the language of pregnancy, not defining the terms of pregnancy. Um, and certainly not really recognizing how the pregnant woman got pregnant in the first place. So we don't often see the agency of men behind the situation of a woman who faces a crisis pregnancy. So for a variety of reasons, I know that I need to do a lot more work on researching some of these latest bills. Um, but I, I am suspicious that some of these um, will make things will contribute to women's suffering instead of making things better. And what I, what I would hope that a consistent ethic of life would do would eliminate women's suffering and offer consistent support, especially for women who are already facing complex traumas. Um, so I'm, I'm suspicious that some of these laws are not actually doing that, that they're gonna re-traumatize in other ways, especially if it doesn't come with these additional social supports. So one more question, and this is one we kind of it went back and forth on an email. And, and because we're in the middle of this COVID crisis and we've got these number of vaccines, I'd just like you to address the issue of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Yes, yeah, so I, I thank you for bringing that up because this did cause quite a lot of confusion in the Catholic community. Um, so I have to say I was irritated um, by the statement out of New Orleans. And my position is that when offered a vaccine, um, you should take it. And that taking any of the three available vaccines right now is not cooperation with evil uh, in any way. And that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is not problematic. Um, so with regard to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the HEK293 cell lines that have become more well-known and uh, sort of a, a source of controversy. They were originally obtained from the remains of a deceased fetus following an elective abortion. Uh, this was in the 1970s. Um, but I think it's important to note that there's no ongoing use of fetal tissue in the research uh, that led to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So, it, if you're not already aware, then these uh, HEK293 cells are also widely used for food and cosmetic testing, as well as drug research. Um, so the cell line does not contain any human remains. And I think that a lot of what we've seen in the Catholic press has been unfortunate because it didn't um, help us to see uh, some of these deeper issues. 
So I talked earlier about the principle of cooperation, and there are some who say that this is um, material remote cooperation, meaning that the cooperator does not intend the evil act and it would be remote from the so-called evil action. So that means that there's a great deal of separation between the person who's taking the vaccine and the original abortion. Um, so we would have to engage in a proportionate a proportionist analysis, in other words. Um, but another benefit to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is that it's completed in one dose. It doesn't require um, deep refrigeration, you know, of a very low temperature. And so it can be made much more widely available. And this is especially important in the context of the pandemic and for rural communities and communities that would have a harder time getting off of work for that second dose. So for a variety of reasons, I think that if you have access to a vaccine and your provider says that it would be safe for you to take, then my recommendation is that it is um, morally responsible to take in any of the three vaccines that are available. Thank you. You know, one of the things as you were talking about this remote, it, there, is, there are these like, um, ethical lines that you just kind of have to do this cutting thing to see how close, you know, and it's just such an, um, it's almost like you have to be an expert in Catholic ethics to be able to know what these little fine lines are. So I really appreciate your being somebody who can help us find those fine lines and get beyond some something that sometimes can be like, uh, uh, battering over our head. So I, I really appreciate Emily. Thank you so much for everything. I would like to, um, I want to, we're almost at time. So I want to thank a bunch of people, particularly you, Emily, for that wonderful presentation and particularly for um, addressing these questions that come at you without any preparation. So you, you've done an amazing job with that. So thank you very much. I also want to thank the people on the Aquinas Center staff who are all the behind the scenes people here. Um, Alice Cameron, who's done all the logistical work. Demelis Sacriste, who is our Facebook guru, who's gotten us live on Facebook. Kelly Tabor and Lindsay Faust, who are our graduate students who are, um, they're the ones who have been uh, making sure we get the questions out for, for Emily. And, and then also thank the Medical Students for Life the Catholic Center at Emory and Commonweal Magazine for helping us co-sponsor this. And so we're going to take, um, we're, um, we're going to uh, end, take some quiet time. Alice is gonna shut us all down. And so thank you all for joining us. It's been an amazing evening. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for this opportunity. Good night.